Welcome back to my channel. I'm Ryan Kathke, and in this video, we're going to talk about how to use SQLite with PowerShell. Let's jump in. Where are we going? We'll start by talking about what is SQLite. Then we'll talk about why you should use SQLite or why do you care. Then we'll discuss and demonstrate how to use SQLite with PowerShell, leveraging the PS SQLite module, which is freely available. Now I'm going to post some links in the description so that you can go to my other videos. I've done many on SQLite, a lot of them talking about using it with Python, but you can also look at ones that are just generic. A key utility you may want to look at is a complete GUI called SQLite Studio, which lets you manage, create, and query objects in SQLite databases. So you'll have something you can kind of leverage to verify what you're doing with PowerShell. What is SQLite? It's an open source, lightweight, run anywhere database management system. It's the number one database on the planet according to its own website. And that probably is true because your iPhones, your, your Android phones, etc. It's the number one mobile database. It's used in many edge devices. And because of that, it is probably just about everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And it runs on Windows, iOS, Linux, etc. It's built into Python, which you may wonder, why do I care? Well, with Python becoming so popular, it's even grown as an admin tool. Therefore, you may encounter situations where you want to integrate with Python code and applications. And since SQLite is a built-in database for Python, you're already good to go. Now, it's not part of Python per se. It's just a library which comes with the standard Python distribution. So pretty much anybody who's using Python probably uses it here and there, and it is integrated with the language. It is a full SQL implementation. What I mean by that is it's very rich. It supports uh, you know, Windows functions and queries. You can create tables and views and indexes. So it's not really like a, a fluffy light database. It's actually very powerful. And it has rich database management system functionality and some of the things I just mentioned. And it scales well, but I do want to caution, this is not a replacement for something like SQL Server or Postgres, which are really meant for enterprise database management systems. Remember I said that it's really targeted towards like edge devices, but it can scale into, according to their own documentation, terabytes. I mean, they say many terabytes, but of course that's gonna be limited by, number one, the size of what a file can be on your system because it does store itself in a file, and also how much memory is available on your client machine that's generally going to be running it. So it does serve a different use case than an enterprise database. Namely, it's meant to be used locally, it's not meant to use like remote connections into it and it's really designed to be one client maintaining it although other clients could query it at the same time that part has to be kind of limited why use sqlite it provides a nice local database you can store data in since it's free it's available why not now you may even think about things like i know sql server is coming up with an edge version it's supposed to be smaller and lightweight but SQLite is extremely lightweight, very small memory footprint, much smaller than something like, say, SQL Server's uh, client side database that's meant for the edge. So it's really good for that. Zero configuration, in other words, you just use it. There's really nothing to do, as you'll see. And you can stage, clean, and transform data. That's kind of the space I normally occupy, and so I like it that way. So you could, for instance, bring in data. You might want to monitor database usage and put statistics into it and then maybe take snapshots periodically where you can then do analysis and comparison. Maybe you want to monitor jobs that are going on and see when they kick off, when they stop, etc. You can store all kinds of metrics, users logging in, on and on. So the typical things you would use PowerShell for can be used to store data in SQLite and then used to query it. Could be used temporarily just to hold it and then push it into another database like Postgres if you want to consolidate it and make it generally available. The data can be shared with anyone. Now, the easiest way to share a SQLite database is simply give someone the copy of the file. So you could email somebody the .db file and they have it. So that bit is a strength, but it also opens a security issue, but it is really easy to share SQLite databases. And as I mentioned, it runs on Windows, runs on Linux, runs on iOS, and it even runs on Android. Because of the ability to just copy it, it's just a file in your file system, it's not a good place to store confidential data. No personally identi identifying information should be there. Let me start out with a warning, which is never install any code on your system that you haven't vetted, you haven't checked, and tested 
locally in a secure way before you use it. And that certainly goes for any code I post, as well as open source code such as the PS SQLite module. So before you go and install this, make sure you get the proper security approvals in your organization. And of course, test the code first. And when you install it, you're gonna get a warning that you'll need to override because even the PowerShell install is trying to warn you there's potential risk. Now, are they high risk? That's for you to decide. Open source can have its own risks, and anytime you bring in code from outside your organization inside, there are potential risks. Most of the code in this particular script that we're looking at, I copied. The author was Rambling Cookie Monster, and here's the link I got it from. So I'm full, full disclosure, a lot of this code is what that person posted. I have tweaked it and made some changes to fit my needs here, but by and large, that's where I got it from. Now, if you don't already have PS SQLite installed, which I'm guessing most people won't, then you're gonna need to run install-module PS SQLite. You'll only be able to do that, however, if you are running PowerShell 5 or above. So if you're running something earlier than that, then you're gonna have to go through these steps of downloading the code from the repository, unzipping it, and extracting it as documented here. You can find everything you need to know about that by just going to this link and it'll explain all that. To install PS SQLite, you need to start PowerShell in administrator mode. How do I do that? Well, in my case, I wanna run the PowerShell IDE. So I right mouse click on this, right mouse click on Windows PowerShell ISE, and then I would have to select run as administrator. That will allow me to install files on my system. If you're running from the PowerShell command line, you just have to start that similarly, making sure that you're starting it as administrator. If you don't have that authority, you will not be able to install the module. I'm not in administrative mode because I've already installed it. But once you're done doing that, you don't need to be in administrative mode. Then you can just use it. We're going to start by clear host. And then I'm going to say import module PS SQLite verbose. And you can see that it lists the functions which are in the modules because of verbose and it shows you that it did load it. So that's, we can always get the list of functions available using the get command. So get command and then passing the module as a parameter. And we can see we have invoke SQL bulk copy. We're gonna demonstrate that. We're gonna look at running queries using invoke dash SQLite query. New SQLite connection is how we can open a database connection and we can use out data table. We're not gonna look at update SQLite at this point but we'll see all the other functions to some extent. And I plan to do more videos on this, put comments in to the extent that you like that and you wanna see more of that. But uh, my intention is to go a little bit more into this topic because I think there's quite a bit of value. So let's start by connecting to a SQLite database. We're gonna create a database name, which we'll store in the string dollar sign database. Then we will use new SQLite connection and pass in the data source, which is the database name and notice it's my db.db it's just a file on the system so it's going to go to whatever my current directory is and it's going to create a file called my db.db db is the file extension currently used by sqlite to identify its database files sqlite just stores all its tables and views and its objects in a flat file on your system so i'm going to run all of this and at the end it will display the connection object so we can see what it looks like we can see right here, this is the database connection and it tells us that's the data source name. So it kind of confirms that it looks like it worked okay. I'm gonna create a query to create a new table. Now I've been running this a while, so I'm gonna drop the table before I go running this. But here we are, create a table called names and it consists of the column full name, which is primary key, surname, which is a text column, given name is a text column and the birth date, which is a date time column. So we're gonna run that. And all that did is it's just creating the query string. We haven't run it yet. So as a side note, before we continue, if I had called my database colon memory colon, as you see here, that would actually create an in-memory temporary database. So whatever I create and things like that would stay persistent as long as I have the connection to SQLite and then it disappears. So that can be a popular way to create objects on the fly, do things so you'll have a place to work temporarily and then move on and you don't have to worry about cleaning things up. In our case, we're using a physical database. All right, we want to first make sure we drop the table names if it exists. So a way we can do this that will not generate an error if the table does not exist is simply say drop table if exists names. 
Now that's a SQL statement, and we can run it by using invoke SQLite query. And then we just pass as the query the SQL statement, as you see here. We always have to tell it what's the connection, which is pointing us to our database. I want to take a side note here, too, because in the original documentation that I copied from, the invoke SQLite query and all of the different queries that were used used this data source option instead of the SQLite connection object I'm using. I found this does not work when the database file does not already exist. In other words, if it's already exists, it seems to be OK. But if it doesn't exist, it gives you an error. So using the SQLite connection is nice because if the file doesn't already exist, it will just create it. And if it does exist, it will open it up and make it ready for usage. So here we're going to invoke the query. And it's called query. We're going to run this. OK, so now the, in query, what we have, let me just show you what's in there. It's our create statement right here at the bottom. So I want to run that to create our empty table. And we should have a table there now. One of the one of the types of statements you can run in SQLite is called a pragma. So you can see here, pragma. Pragma is a bit of a, a throwback, to be honest. In more modern databases, I guess you could say, you would probably just be able to query the SQL database catalog, which should be stored under something called information schema. So in SQL Server, Postgres, and many other databases, you have information schema, which allows you to query metadata or data about the objects in the database. But instead, there's a bit of a workaround in SQLite where you can use pragmas, or you can query a table called SQLite Master. So what I want to do here is just confirm that our table was created by looking at the definition. So I'm going to say invoke SQLite query, again, passing the connection object. And the query is going to run a pragma table info. And then notice the names table, the one we created as a parameter. I'm going to pump that into outgrid view because I just like outgrid view. I think it's a really nice way to see data. So you can see it's got the names, the type of the object, etc. Now I want to run a query. Again, I, I'm storing things in string objects. I don't have to. I could hard code them, but I'm putting them into string variables instead. I'm going to insert into the names table a single instance, and you can see it here. I want to call your attention to we can pass parameters to our queries by putting the at sign and then the name of the parameter. We can do it here. We've got it in two places, where at full is and where at BD is. So let's create first the query. And when we run it, we're going to do invoke SQLite again, right? SQLite query, connection again, the query. But then notice we have this SQLite parameter. And we're passing that by putting the at sign, and then the open braces, and then we just pass the name, name and values of our parameters. And that should just insert a single row for us. We're going to do a quick test of it by just running a query to say, select everything from names. And we should just get a single row back. And you can see here we do. Now let's try creating a bunch of fake data in the system. I'm going to create this little block of code, data table. And it's just going to generate a lot of dummy data, essentially. The idea here is to generate a big enough table to use the SQLite bulk copy to insert it, which is faster and more efficient than just doing a standard insert. Looking at this, we're going to create a data table. And then we're going to run this code. And we're going to pump it out to out data table. Then we can use out data table to insert into our table. Now I want to run SQLite bulk copy. And I'm going to take that data table we just created. And I'm going to insert it into our table names. So we've got one row in there. When we're done, we should have the one row and a bunch of other names. Notice we have a parameter to notify after. So it's going to prompt us and say, after whatever number we have 1,000, prompt us that we really want to continue. And we're going to use verbose to get more information as this command runs. So let's run that. And you can see it came up and said, OK, what do you want to do here? And I'm going to say yes to all. And then it just finished the whole process. Now, to check that the data actually did what I wanted, I can say invoke SQLite query, again, passing the connection. And I can say select asterisk from names. And I'm going to limit it to just five rows. I can just say limit five. You can see it worked great. We can see the original row we inserted at the top. And then you can see a few rows here. But it's actually got thousands of rows from what we just inserted from the generated set. To keep things short, that's all I'm going to demonstrate today. But I'll come back with some more demonstrations of what we can do with SQLite and PowerShell. Wrapping up, we started out by talking about what is SQLite. And we learned that it's an open source, robust database management system really designed for client-side operations. And although it's limited 
in the sense that it's really designed around a single client working away with things or limited access, but on a local drive, it can handle some pretty large amounts of data. Why use it? A variety of reasons, but most importantly, there's going to be times when you're going to want to save some data, do some queries, and there are a lot of different applications for this. You can think of your own, but any kind of monitoring, tracking, you could take the data and query it through you could even create it, uh, Power BI dashboards around the data that it stores, et cetera. So it's got a lot of value. It's also a great way to, to sort of transition your skills away from strictly PowerShell into languages like Python. We demonstrated how to use SQLite with PowerShell by using the PS SQLite module. There's also a SQLite provider, which gives you a more command line orientation way to use SQLite. But I'm not sure that's been maintained. It looks like the repository for it is being phased out and I don't see the new one yet. So we'll see if we do a video on that in the future. If you have other interest or you think there's things like Postgres or things like that you'd like to see with PowerShell, let me know in the comments. We'll take a look at that too. It's been a while since I've done a PowerShell video. I apologize. I've kind of been off to my Spark and Databricks side of things for a while. But my love for PowerShell keeps drawing me back. There's going to be additional videos in the description. I encourage you to look at them, especially the ones that just talk about uh, introduction to SQLite and SQLite Studio, which is a really nice tool around that. And that's it for me. So please like, share, subscribe, let people know about my channel. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. All in this together. Thank you.